From Heterodox Academy, this is Half Hour of Heterodoxy. Conversations with scholars and authors, ideas from diverse viewpoints and perspectives. Here's your host, Chris Martin. Welcome to a special holiday episode of Half Hour of Heterodoxy. Dr. Ellen Hendrickson, my guest on today's episode, is host of the Savvy Psychologist podcast. It's one of the most popular podcasts on mental health, and it was picked as a best new podcast of 2014. Ellen is a Boston-based clinical psychologist and author of How to Be Yourself, Quiet Your Inner Critic, and Rise Above Social Anxiety. We'll be talking about how to maintain your sanity in academia, which I hope is useful to all our listeners, but especially those who are doing heterodox research on contentious topics. Hi, Ellen. Thanks for joining us. Thanks so much for having me, Chris. So we are going to talk about lots of challenges that you can face if you're an academic and you're trying to maintain your sanity in an environment that's full of debates and contentious dialogue. So let's start with the topic of how to deal with sarcastic people, because there are quite a few of those. Not that I would ever use sarcasm myself. No, uh, never. Never, of course. But uh, if you're doing research that other people don't like or they don't like your findings, one thing you might face is sarcasm. So what tips do you have if you're let's say, doing a job presentation or job talk at a new university or just doing a regular talk and people are sarcastic because they don't like your findings. Sure. So um, I guess let me start out by saying that sarcasm isn't necessarily all bad. Like, it, it, you know, it can be used to, to compliment someone. So, um, you know, my go-to example is uh, saying something like, oh, you majored in applied math? Oh, you're a real slacker, you know, or something like that. Um, and so, you know, sarcasm can be used to be self-deprecating or to, uh, to, to compliment people. But yes, it often is used for nefarious purposes. And so, especially when we are at the receiving end of that, it can, it can really hurt. And so the, the, the definition of sarcasm, or, or essentially how you can tell something is sarcastic, is that the content of what is being said is the opposite of the tone that is being used. So those two things are incongruent. So for instance, if someone were to say to you, wow, that's really original, then that that tone and that content are congruent. Whereas if someone were to say, wow, that's really original, then you know that that's sarcasm because the tone and the content are, are different. All right. So if, if we are unfortunate enough to, uh, to encounter sarcasm at, you know, during a talk or in feedback or from a colleague, so there are a number of things we can do. And so one is to answer them literally because sarcasm is you know, fundamentally supposed to be a joke, right? And so, and so to, you can kind of turn it on its head by playing dumb, doing kind of a Columbo move and pretending that you didn't understand it. So if you're faced with that comment I mentioned before, like, wow, that's original, you could say, you know, thank you so much. Yeah, I worked really hard on this research. I, I think this offers some new findings and let me tell you why. So, so you could, you could kind of drive over it with a, with a literal answer. Um, so does that work well in one-on-one uh, -on -one conversations and in groups? You, you could, I think, I think this is, it's all, you know, this is all kind of a uh, mix and match to the person that you're talking to and the, um, the, the, what's happening uh, in the moment. So, you know, certainly use some good judgment. Uh, I wouldn't give any of these as hard and fast rules, but they are tools to put in your toolbox and take out as needed. So uh, I guess the second strategy is to simply ignore them. So folks who are sarcastic habitually are often kind of grumpy and are often, you know, like will, folks who put time and energy into putting you down or to, um, trying to get a rise out of you, or that that's, as we say in psychology, that's diagnostic. And so if you can tell that they want you to feel as miserable as they do, because misery doesn't just love company, misery loves miserable company, simply ignore them, like let it slide off your back, and maybe even try to dig deep down and feel some compassion for them. Say like, wow, they must be really miserable or really lonely to have to be so prickly. So that's, that's a nice way to try to deal with it. And then finally, this might not work for everyone, but if you're willing to meet it 
head on, you can give them some, essentially some free advice and say, you know, I think I, I appreciate your sense of humor. You know, it's, it's wickedly sharp. You have a nice, you know, sense of, uh, like of, of sarcasm. Um, however, like, I know you don't mean to be hurtful, but sometimes that comes across as, as hostile. So I'm guessing that's not what you mean, but I just want to, I just want to give you some, some feedback. So you can address it head on and talk about the, uh, the comment more as the process, like that was hurtful, um, as opposed to trying to deal with the, the content. So those are some some ways that we can try to deal with those sarcastic folks that we come across either in the academy or just in life. When you were in grad school, can you think of instances when uh, you could have used any of those? Because there's a particular dynamic when you're a junior person. There is. I think for for me, um, dealing with sarcastic people was was less of a problem. And I think um, I was lucky enough to go to a, a a graduate program that was largely supportive and um, and encouraging. I think uh, later on in my career, uh, I I faced um, you know some like, like we all do, you know, criticism of my work or um, just the it was in the air that that somehow all the junior people were incompetent, and so uh, trying to not internalize that was was my particular challenge. Fair enough. So. On a related note, what about dealing with your political opposite? Now, that's not necessarily a topic that involves sarcasm, but it could get into sarcasm. Um, it could just be very contentious. So you had a recent episode with Jeannie Safer about how to do that. Can you talk a bit about that? Sure. So just a little bit of background. So Jeannie Safer is a uh, psychotherapist in New York City, and she's she's lovely. She's a character, and uh, and she's been in practice for, gosh, 40 years, maybe more. So she's a liberal Democrat and she is married to a conservative Republican. And he is not just any conservative Republican, he is uh, one of the editors of the National Review. And so, uh, but they've been happily married for, you know, I think 45 years. And uh, we talked about how to live with your political opposite. And especially- And this episode in, aired about a week or two ago, correct? It was, it was, it was a few weeks ago, yeah, yeah. And uh, um, I, I enjoyed talking to her very much. Um, she also hosts a, a podcast titled "I Love You, But I Hate Your Politics." So oh. that's a nice old shout out for for her. I should and check that out. Yeah, yeah, it's it's good. It's good. Um, and uh, and so she talks a lot about looking for the other things that that you have in common, the other things that bind you together. And so, for instance, for her and her husband, she talks about their love of music. And also just their shared values, their mutual respect for each other, their intellectual um, uh, discussions. And, and so looking for all the other things besides politics that, uh, that you can agree on. And so, so that's, I think that's a really nice, again, tool to put in your toolbox to remember that, you know, it, it, it can be hard in, in these times uh, to, to not write someone off, certainly. Uh, if, if they disagree with you, but because that, that seems to be the MO for whatever reason, um, but to, to broaden the spotlight, to not just have it shine upon political uh, differences, but to broaden it and see everything else that makes up this particular person. That uh, actually gels with something we covered in a previous episode here. It was about three episodes ago with um, uh, Lucia Martinez Valdivia, who talked about how at the undergraduate level, undergraduates may have a variety of identities and a variety of characteristics, but one thing they share in common is they're all students. They're all eager mm -hmm. to learn. They all know they have a lot to learn in college mm -hmm. uh, because it's different from high school. So that is something they all have in common that they're not encouraged necessarily to think about much. Yeah, I think something that uh, uh, most um, adults can agree on is that no matter your political stripes, everybody believes in working hard and like following your dream. And so I think that is something that, that we can all agree on and can be a way to connect in a conversation uh, with the political opposite uh, and to find some common ground. So in a situation that's not a marriage, but let's say it's a conversation with someone at a party, someone you just met, do you have any recent examples where you discovered someone was your political opposite and you were able to use these yeah. tactics or... So I, I live, for better or worse, I live in Cambridge, Massachusetts. So, uh, so I'm in the bluest of blue bubbles. Um, but uh, that said, I, you know, I have family from all 
stripes and all walks of life. And so um, some some of it is is a little bit of tiptoeing. Like we know when we're getting into territory that will probably you know lead to disagreement. And sometimes that's okay, and we can do that and still be respectful. Um, and sometimes we just stop and talk about something else, like the the kids or the dog or or something that is politically neutral. So it's it can you know it can take some navigation, but I think you know we, we we're all practiced in that. Okay. So another issue is when you're having a debate, sometimes, especially if it's not about you personally, you can take something personally. Mm. I mean, when you're doing research, you're, you should be focused on your research findings, but a comment about your findings could be something you take personally. And uh, you wrote a Scientific American article on how mm. to not take things personally. So what advice would you have for academics who are, uh, whether graduate students or professors, who are prone to do that? Sure. Yeah. And I guess this is where we can link back. You asked me if I had dealt with sarcastic people in uh, graduate school. And, and my answer was no, not really. But, but I, I did struggle with not taking things personally. And so I think uh, here is where, um, where it, you know, that resonated with me. Um, so there, there are two sides to this. So on the one side, we often say, um, the, the prevailing wisdom is, you know, it's not you, it's them. Like that something is wrong with the people who are harshly criticizing you. And sometimes that is true. And academics is full of egos and characters and, um, you know, eccentrics who may not be the greatest socially. And so one thing... Right, especially fields like psychology and sociology, uh, which are filled with people who are very puzzled by how other people are behaving. It's so true. It's so true. Yeah. Yes. And, uh, and so, so one thing you can do is certainly to consider the source. And so if the critique comes from someone who you like and respect, that might make you sit up and say, oh, maybe I should do a course correction here. But if it's someone who doesn't know you well, someone who's been known to shoot their mouth off, someone who has all the subtlety of a brick, you know, someone who is, has a reputation for uh, being curmudgeonly, then, then that, that can help you decide whether this is feedback that you should take or if this is feedback that you can just leave at the door. So just because somebody says it doesn't mean it's true, certainly. And you get to decide whether to listen to it or not. So even if it gets said, ultimately, you have the power to choose whether to accept it or reject it. And I think that is a really nice uh, way to kind of reclaim uh, you know, the, the, the insult or you know, whatever is being levied at you and, uh, and to be able to um, to, to take some power back there. Now, so that's the it's them side. Um, but there is also that sometimes it's us side. And so, so for me, like I, I, I am, I'm a, of a sensitive nature. And so something that, that hangs together with uh, being a little bit sensitive is often having a very strict moral code, like having a very strong moral compass, which is important, certainly, but can uh, but it can have a downside where if we, you know, there's a, a criticism levied at us or something to that extent, it can be very easy for us to say like, how, like that, she can't say that, like, how dare she, that's wrong. Like to, to, to see the act as something wrong in and of itself, like this is not how things should be. But I think if we get caught up in that, like, even if that shouldn't have been said, it still was said. And so getting st stuck in the, you know, shouldn't or the can't, uh, we, we still have to deal with it. And so I think that we need to remember that getting offended and feeling all indignant isn't necessarily helpful. So that we can, you know, certainly we can rage against the unfairness of it all, but then it's important to move on. And so that is where you can use what I talked about before and consider the source. Um, and see if this is really something you want to take to heart, if this is constructive criticism, or if this is just someone kind of running their mouth. And when you say that, you mean it's you should let it go as opposed to holding on resentment for a long time, which actually occupies your own time. Exactly, exactly. So uh, what's what is what's that the quote like? You know, resentment is like swallowing poison and expecting the other person to die. Like it's it doesn't help us, and it doesn't punish the the person who did you wrong anyway. Right, yeah. There's another quote about forgiveness is forgiveness is like letting a bird go free and then realizing the bird was you. Mm, mm -hmm. Or letting a bird out of a cage and then realizing that bird was you. That makes sense. Yeah. 
I talk about forgiveness a bit during my happiness class, and there's some there's some good research out there now on how to if you really want to forgive someone, but you don't know how, mm-hmm. how you can follow a step by step process. It's uh, let me think, it's Everett Worthington's research at VCU. He's got a free workbook online, so hmm. I like I like his work. Um, and he approaches it from both a religious and non-religious angle too. So he's a Christian. So he talks about how from a, some of his books are written from a Christian perspective on the importance of forgiveness, but some of his books are also just a secular perspective on how to be more forgiving and less resentful. So I think um, to to riff on that for a, a second, I think that something else we can do is to uh, to challenge as, as okay. So as academics, we're often perfectionistic, like we often like want to do things right and well and are very conscientious. And, uh, and so, but there is a big um, overlap between, you know, perfectionism and like not being very good at taking feedback because we, when we get negative feedback, you know, like it kind of blows away all we've worked so hard for. And so I think we can reframe this, we can reframe um, getting negative feedback as perfectionists by folding it into the perfectionism, you can say, okay, I'm going to get better at receiving criticism. Like I am going to improve this and get better at it so that I can even be a high achiever when it comes to, uh, you know, uh, getting uh, criticism. Um, But another thing to do, and this is the opposite, and you can kind of do these at the same time, which is a little odd, but you can also try to uh, accept your imperfection. It's really hard to loosen one's grip you know it feels dangerous but um but acknowledging that you're not perfect and accepting that uh can be really empowering and and make that criticism uh sting less because then it will not cut so deep yeah i think your your mindset also helps i mean talking about perfectionism i think some of that comes also from a sense of wanting to outrank other people Mm -hmm. and getting Mm -hmm. a sense of of uh self-esteem from your level of performance as opposed to your Mm. absolute mastery. So your relative Mm -hmm. performance uh, means you need to outrank other people and trying to focus it more on on mastery. So not whether you have published in more top journals than your colleagues, but rather whether you're doing better than you were doing last year or two Mm. years ago, whether you've learned more since then. That's a fantastic tip. So uh, getting back to politics for just a few moments. um, Sure. How do you deal with uh, today's news overload and just deal with today's political climate more broadly? Oh my goodness. Uh, that is a $64,000 question, isn't it? Right. Um, yes. So, okay. So, so I'm, a, I'm a clinical psychologist. So I really gravitate towards applied you know, tips and techniques like try this, like let's, let's do this. And so um, I'm an anxiety specialist. And one of the uh, tools we have for folks with generalized anxiety disorder is this thing called worry time, where if worries arise during the day, we have them ask themselves, you know, do I need to deal with this right now? And if the answer is yes, then, you know, go do that. But if the answer is no, we have them shunt it to what we call worry time. And so we have them carve out a particular time during the day in which to worry. And so that could be their commute home, or it could be right before dinner or whatever, you know, whatever they choose. And so you can you can apply this to the news cycle and news overload because with our phones and with you know monitors everywhere we go from the airport to restaurants to you know waiting rooms everything like we're just being inundated with news all day long and so to the extent we can control it i would say to institute news time so instead of like checking the news every time you look at your email or every time you look at your phone or you know clicking on that notification that that pops up to designate a time and space to consume the news and so you could think of it as rather than snacking all day long okay you're going to eat three meals or rather than running yourself ragged all day long this is your workout so to to circumscribe the time that you spend looking at the news so that's that's a my my biggest tip um and certainly just another thing to do is to just unsubscribe to all the stuff that that comes at you to you know narrow it down to the sources that um, are important to you you know whether or not you agree with them there's so much uh, advice out there to say you know to not only subscribe to the news sources that you agree with but also to at least one or two that you don't to get the other point of view and also quite honestly to confuse your social media algorithms so they don't just keep you in a bubble and send you the things that they think uh, that the algorithm thinks you're going to like. Um, 
So to filter ruthlessly and because that when, you know, when the news is drowning you out, like you can, you can bail out your metaphorical boat by just, just cutting down the amount of information that is coming in. Yeah, I've actually thought about deleting Twitter from my cell phone, and that's mm. difficult to do, but I may do it one of these days just for sure. my own sanity. Well, and then you can always reinstall it, right? Like I, um, I, when I was feeling a little bit burned out, maybe a, a, about a year ago, um, I found myself in an unfortunate like YouTube habit when I was supposed to be working, and I just deleted it from my phone. And you know, then you know, once I got myself in a better place, I reinstalled it, and now it's fine. It's not tempting anymore. But uh, you know, I think if 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 there is an app that is clearly impeding our life or clearly sucking our attention and time away, just get rid of it. You can always install it again later. Yeah, I'm trying to convince my wife to turn off the thing that actually gives her notifications of news. So sure. it actually causes yeah. her phone to yeah. ping. Yeah. And she picks it up and there's some news there. Exactly. So it's a very it's a push oriented system. Yeah, yes. when I was doing research on my dissertation, I was talking to therapists at college counseling centers about what might cause anxiety to be going up among college students. And they said when they were younger, so these were people who are now about fifty or sixty years old. And when they were younger, there was a natural bubble in college because there was one phone on the hallway. And there were no TVs in dorm rooms. Mm. So you were uh, insulated from the external world to some degree. You had to consume it in small, healthy doses. Yeah, no. And I think in addition to just the the sheer volume of news making us anxious, I think the fact that we can control uh, what we consume so tightly, like we can we can easily get lost in a you know rabbit hole of our own control for hours online. And so if we are not looking at uh, or, or being faced with uh, news or viewpoints or you know, even things that we're not particularly interested in, we are not as good at dealing with uncertainty or ambiguity or um, like just anything that we haven't hand curated. And so that you know, uncertainty uh, drives anxiety and so I think when we're used to being in total control all the time, whether it's being able to look at the restaurant menu beforehand online or know exactly where we're going because of Google Maps or not have to talk to somebody to ask how to you know, do a household chore because we can just look it up on YouTube, then that drives anxiety because we have less experience under our belts in knowing that we can navigate uncertainty, that we know how to ask a stranger for directions if we get lost or we know how to you know, think on the fly, uh, that we can walk into a party having not checked the guest list on Evite before and just you know, deal with whoever's there and start some conversations. So I think uh, the fact that we can control our consumption so tightly is also driving anxiety. Yeah, and Robert Wright, whom I interviewed uh, maybe six or seven months ago, has a, uh, a newsletter called a Mindful Resistance Newsletter, jumping ah. back to the topic of politics. Uh, and the goal of the newsletter is first uh, to to phrase things in a more balanced way, so uh, not to phrase things in a way that actually raises your ire, but just mm. sort of objectively describes uh, current political scandals and what the risks are and how they might be resolved. Uh, they, t they took a break over the summer. So I think I interviewed him in May and he took a break and the newsletter is back and it's free. And I'm not involved in the writing or production of it in any way, but I do like it. So um, any other tips before we wrap up on how to deal with academic job stress, especially if you're doing contentious research, but just in general? Just in, in closing, I would say for folks, especially young academics, we often think we have to go into... Uh, our our first job or our you know our our department uh, and exude competence and confidence and interestingly so this is uh, Susan Fisk and Amy Cuddy's work before Amy Cuddy was doing power posing uh, they found that uh, for first impressions that the thing that people pay closest attention to in first impressions is warmth and that is defined as simply being kind and sincere and trustworthy. And so I think that that knowledge that, you know, the, the competence and, and confidence can come later, but, but at first to simply try to be a good colleague, like if you're trying to make tenure to, to be, try to just be, be yourself and be someone who is interested in your colleagues, who is a team player and is warm, is friendly. And because essentially, you know, tenure does absolutely have to do with 
your accomplishments, but it also has to do with, is this somebody who I want to be colleagues with for the rest of my life? And, and so to, to certainly, you know, focus on your work, focus on doing the best quality uh, research you can, but also, especially at the beginning, to, to focus on being kind. And that is something we can all do and will get you a long way. So, so that's, that's a, a final wrap up that I think we often forget, uh, but is so important. I think that's great advice. That also reminds me of Adam Grant's work on being a giver. So being mm -hmm. kind by actually being generous and making sure part of your work is simply helping other people out of uh, general interest in their work. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank you for joining us and happy holidays. Of course. Happy holidays to you too. Appreciate it. Ellen's podcast is The Savvy Psychologist. Her website is ellenhendrickson.com, and you can find her on Twitter at Ellen Hendrickson. Her book is called How to Be Yourself, Quiet Your Inner Critic and Rise Above Social Anxiety. My next guest on the show is historian Kevin Cruz. We'll be talking about his book Fault Lines, co-authored with Julian Selizer. The book covers the history of the United States since 1974. If you have any comments about today's episode, you can contact me at podcast at heterodoxacademy.org or tag me on Twitter at chrismartin76. Thanks for listening and happy holidays. This podcast is produced by Heterodox Academy. Find us online at heterodoxacademy.org, on Twitter at HDX Academy, and on Facebook.